So when it comes to audit and assurance, it's an introductory level paper for advanced audit and assurance in level three, meaning that your ability to be able to understand well what is here will make your journey much easier, and very, very easier when you are in level three doing the advanced audit and assurance. So it's very important to understand. Now, among other things, the entire syllabus for the advanced audit and assurance is divided into five sections. Five sections. So, did I say five? No, more than five. Two, four, six, eight, nine sections. So, we're going to be looking at the nature of audit and assurance. We will consider the issue in relation to international standards on auditing. We will look at the regulatory environment of auditing. Four, we will consider accepting and managing engagement. Five, we will look at the issue about planning and engagement. Six, we look at engagement evidence. Seven, we will consider audit review. Eight, concluding and reporting. And then lastly, we will consider internal audits. So these are the nine things we'll be talking about throughout the syllabus. For uh, concentration-wise, this is just 5% of the syllabus. This is 10% of the syllabus. This is 10%, 10%. Planning and engagement is 15. Audit evidence, 20%. Audit review, 10, 10. So these are the things. So you realize that the nature of audit and assurance is a minor area, just five percent. International standards on auditing, ten percent. Regulatory environment of auditing, 10%. How do we accept and manage the audit? So what are the factors to be taken into consideration before accepting an audit engagement? Planning is very critical because before you start anything, you must what? plan about the audit. So how do we plan the audit? How do we do risk assessment? How do we find out whether this company is a good fit for us? We're going to be looking at that. But most importantly, at the end of the day, because you are going to be issuing an auditor's report, you must gather what we call audit evidence. So the way we gather audit evidence is also something critical that we'll be considering, and that is 20%. So the syllabus grading gives a guide on the focus and what we have to look at there in that session. Then at the end of the day, when we end our audit, we must review the audit to ensure that everything we've done is well. Then we must conclude and report on the audit. Then certainly, in addition to considering all of these, we must look at how internally the organization itself can undertake its audit assignments. So these are the nine things that we'll be discussing in the course of the 17 weeks that we have before us to uh, the examination and find out what we can do in relation to that. Now, to start off, I'm going to give you something I call Introduction to Audit and Assurance. And in that Introduction to Audit and Assurance that I'll be discussing with you, possibly, that we'll be discussing possibly today and then next week, we'll really cover almost everything that we'll be doing in the audit. So after that introduction, we will come then and pick some things one after the other and focus on them. So let's look at introduction to audit and assurance.
Now, to look at audit and assurance and start with the introduction, there are five W's and one H that we need to consider. In other words, there are six questions we will answer if we want to understand what audit and assurance is. So, we will have what is auditing, why do we audit, when do we audit, who does the audit, where the auditor expresses his opinion, and then how the auditor carries out the audit. So these are the five W's and one H that we'll be focusing on and looking at as we are looking at the issue about introduction to audit and assurance. So let's begin with the first one. What is auditing? Mm -hmm. What is audit and assurance? What would you say? A review of financial reports. Review of financial reports. Okay. Okay. When you say... Okay, review of financial report. I, I, okay, I'll take that. Review of financial reports. Okay. But then, the question is, in addition to that, why do we review the financial statements? So why? Why would we review the financial statements? To have an assurance that the reports given to the intended user is correct. The intended user is correct or represents a true and fair view of the entity. That is the key word. Now, this is what happens when it comes to organizations usually. So this diagram is going to represent what's really happening in organizations. So we have shareholders on one side and they appoint board of directors. The shareholders are the owners of the business. The board of directors are responsible, so the company is here, to manage the business. So they are responsible for the day-to-day -day management of the business. But at the end of the day, they must be accountable to the shareholders. How do they show their accountability? They show their accountability by their preparation and presentation of what? Financial statements. For this reason, we say the board of directors or management are responsible for the preparation of financial statements. So they prepare the financial statement and that financial statement is sent to the shareholders. So the shareholders use the financial statement to measure performance of the company and make various decisions. But when shareholders are presented with a financial statement, they want to find out, is this really what is happening in the company? So it's just like you are buying a dress. You go somewhere, you are buying a dress or something like that. Now you wear a dress, stand before the mirror, you look at it yourself, you see that it's good on you. But sometimes you don't trust yourself much, so you ask somebody, how does it look? So when someone else tells you that it is good, then you are confident to what? Buy the dress and go ahead. I hope you've experienced that before. Now, the same thing happens to companies. It is not that shareholders don't trust management, rather, Shareholders want to just be sure that management is actually doing their work well and most importantly that the financial statement prepared represents a true and fair view of the entity or of the company. So for them to have that assurance, that confirmation, they now appoint the auditors. So they now appoint the auditors so that the auditors will add some level of credibility to their financial statement. So the auditors are there in order to independently examine the financial statement. So they add credibility to the financial statement by independently examining the financial statement. That is how the issue about auditing comes to be. So this diagram here actually represents everything. 
However, it is not only shareholders that have that can appoint auditors. There are various other people that can appoint auditors. Management can appoint auditors. Regulatory bodies can appoint auditors, as we saw in the banking sector last year. Bank of Ghana appointed auditors for some of the uh, financial institutions. So regulatory bodies can also appoint auditors. Just that the objectives of the appoint, uh, appointer is going to be different based on what they want to look at. So when a regulatory body appoints an auditor for the firm, they are finding out to check whether the firm is obliging with what? Regulatory requirements. When a shareholder employs an auditor, they want to find out whether financial statement presented to them represent a true and fair view of the entity. Now, the Commissioner General of the Ghana Revenue Authority can also appoint an auditor to audit the financial statement of the company if they realize that the tax filed by the company is faulty or contains some fraud or errors. So there, there, there are different people who can appoint auditors, but there are different objectives for them. In addition to the financial statements, not only are auditors going to be auditing financial statements, but auditors can audit various other issues, like what we call prospective financial information or what we call forecast of the company. So when you are going to a bank for a loan, when a company is going to a bank for a loan, the bank usually needs two things. One, audited financial statements as well as audited prospective financial information. Meaning, what is your budget for the next five years, for the next ten years? So this one gives us how you have done in the past, but this one tells us how you'll be doing in the future. So when you bring this thing, the bank can give it to an audit firm to review that prospective financial statement so that they can now make a decision whether this company can be given the loan. We as auditors can also be appointed to undertake some other non-assurance services and we'll get into these things later on. As I said, it's an introduction overview. So, Other non-assurance services like tax services. We can do some things about the issues in relation to um, system reviews. It can be the accounting systems, their software uh, system that they are using. So we can do tax services, system review. Then we can do some valuation services for them. We come and value their assets for them and all of those things. So these are some other non-assurance services that we can take. So as auditors, we are not just there to audit financial statements, but we are also there to find out or take into consideration other things about an organization or about a company. So this is what you have to understand about how the structure of auditing works. Can I go? Right. So coming back to our 5W and 1H, Let's now focus on the key issues. So what is auditing? In a simple language, we define auditing as the independent examination of financial statements. The independent examination of financial statements. Now remember what I said here, that when the shareholders appoint the auditors, so this is auditors actually, appoint the auditors, the auditors must independently what? examine the financial statement, meaning they must be independent and will come to them under who in a moment. So auditing is the independent examination of financial statements. Keyword, why do we need somebody to audit the financial statement? So why? So the objective of auditing is to express an opinion as to whether financial statement represents a true and fair view of the odds entity. So we, we are auditing because we will express an opinion whether financial statement prepared and presented represents a true and fair view of the entity. That is why we undertake auditing. Nonetheless, when it comes to the why of auditing, 
We can talk about a lot of issues about the why on auditing. So we can boil down to say, what then are the objectives of auditing? Can be divided into two. We have what we call the primary objectives of auditing and then the secondary objective of auditing. The primary objective of auditing is what I said, to express an opinion on what? The financial statement, whether it represents a true and fair view of the entity. That's our primary objective. That is why we are employed. But then, in addition to looking at whether the financial statement represents a true and fair view of the entity, there are other secondary objectives that when we are doing our audit, we, we, we need to achieve that. The first thing has to do with the detection of frauds, fraud and errors. Fraud and errors. Detection of fraud and errors. So we must design our audit in such a way that if there are some fraud and errors existing, we will be able to what? Detect those fraud and errors. But let me state here clearly that it is the management's responsibility to put in place internal control system that will detect, prevent, and correct fraud and errors, which is called the risk of material misstatement. We will get into that later on. So it is the responsibility of management to put in place the system that will be able to detect, that will be able to prevent, that will be able to what? Correct fraud and errors. We as auditors, it is not our duty to detect it. It's not our duty to prevent it. It's not our duty to correct it. However, even though it's not our duty to detect, to prevent, and to correct, we must design our audit in such a way that we will be able to detect some if they exist. So that is a secondary objective of our uh, auditors. Then another objective of auditors, when they are auditing, aside representing true and fair, is to determine the going concern status of the company. Very important, the going concern status of the company simply means can the entity operate into the next foreseeable future to be specific in the next 12 months? Anytime we are auditing financial statements, it is not just about, okay, did the financial statement represent a true and fair view, meaning that is everything okay in the financial statement? We must assess, can this company continue into the foreseeable future? Very important. Very important. In addition to that, our objective is also to look at the effectiveness and efficiency of the internal controls systems in the organization. We should be able to also look at the effectiveness and efficiency of internal control systems in the organization. Please note that internal controls is something we'll be doing later on. It's a whole topic on its own. But it simply means the various system put in place by management in order to what, uh, control how things are done within the organization. So if you go to a company and they say that, okay, in our company, in the production department, there are three people. In the sales department, there are three people. And each of them do ABC. This is called internal control system. Or if you are buying something from, from this company, take, come and pay the money here. Go and take your receipt there. Go and take the goods here. It is called internal control system. Now, that separation of duty is very important in order to prevent what? Fraud and errors. So we as auditors, when we come, we have to find out, okay, the company said they do A, B, and C. We must find out to see whether they are effective or they are efficient. Because if they are not effective, they are not efficient, then the financial statement we are auditing may contain a lot of what? Frauds and errors. So we have to detect errors. We have to determine the going consent status of the company. We have to look at the effectiveness and efficiency of the organization. But this is what happens. You see, you realize that this is not our main objective, detection of fraud and errors. 
Our main objective is to find out whether the financial statement represented true and fair. So there is always a difference between what stakeholders expect the auditor's role to be and what the auditor's role actually is. So the difference between the view of the auditor's role from the perspective of the stakeholders and the auditor's role from the perspective of generally accepted auditing standards is what we refer to as the expectation gap. Have you heard that before? So expectation gap. So expectation gap is the difference between what auditor's role is expected to be and what their role actually is. That's the expectation gap. So for instance, if you come to me and say, Shira, teach me for, for two months, and you are like, uh, in your mind, you think that for the two months, there is a way I should teach the subject. There is a way I should go. Because sometimes, when people, students come for lectures like that, they have a way that they think the teacher should teach the thing. So the difference between how the teacher is actually teaching and how you think the teacher should teach is what we refer to as what? The expectation gap. In auditing also, so shareholders especially, now when we say stakeholders, shareholders are inside. Now shareholders especially, sorry, especially, are expecting that at the end of the audit, the auditor will come and say, aha, uh -huh, shareholders, Munti, Sika and Profoy do a business in the door, so so they are expecting to hear something like that so that they can confirm, yes, that is why the board chairman now has built a new house. That's why the daughter is now in Dubai. But then, they are surprised. When the auditor comes, he, pre he presents them the auditor's report and says everything is okay. Then they are like, hey, with the engine. But that is what leads to what we call what? The expectation gap. But the big question is this. If this is the expectation gap, how can the auditor close the gap? What do you think the auditor can do to close the gap? What do you think, in your opinion? As you process that, let me give you a scenario. Now, in the banking sector, many of the banks that got collapsed or that got overtaken, people are asking, didn't their auditors see those things that Bank of Ghana said they were having challenges with? So in a way, right now in Ghana, the audit profession, people are not giving it the respect that it is supposed to what, be. Into the question is, going forward, people expect that the auditor should be able to see those errors, see those mistakes, and tell the public about it, or tell the regulatory bodies about it. Into right now, there, that gap is very big. So how can the auditor, or the audit firm, or the audit profession close the expectation gap? What do you think? By doing what the stakeholders want. <laughs> wow. Okay, so what do the stakeholders want? For instance. For instance, detection of fraud. Yeah. They want they want us to detect fraud. Yes. So we must make sure that we detect fraud. So the way we put that point is that one way to close the gap is that. The auditor must design the audit in such a way that he will be able to detect as much as possible fraud and errors if they exist. Are you getting the idea? So it means that when we are designing our audits, when we are planning our audits, we plan in such a way that we will be able to detect fraud and errors if they exist. What else do you think we can do? Mm -hmm. Correct. So, we need to educate the stakeholders on the role of the auditor. What the auditor's role actually what is. We need to educate them. What else can we talk about? Mm -hmm. Do you think the Institute of Chartered Accountant has to do something to close this gap? Because this gap, they are responsible. They are part of the responsible bodies for it. Redefining whose roles? The auditor's, the auditor's role. Now, okay, okay, so the CA can come in to read. Now, when you say redefine, 
What do you mean? Redefine the arrow. Yeah, we can redefine the arrow. Maybe the auditors don't know the intensity of what they are doing. So we must inform them about this is your role. This is how you have to report. This is how you have to work, undertake your audit. Then also the CS the CA must issue some sanctions. Okay, on various auditors and audit firms who are involved in some of these issues. So that now people will know that okay, this is what auditors are supposed to do, and this is what they were doing, and that will close the gap. Because you see, like the banks that collapsed, we heard, and I'm saying this on record, we heard that the CA came on to write a letter, they issue a press release that they are looking into the various banks and the various things, and they will come out later on to come and take appropriate actions. As of today, I don't know the action they have taken. But we know that various auditors and various audit firms were involved in the collapse of these banks and these financial institutions. So the question is, if the CA doesn't rise up and then issue some sanctions, issue some penalties, because the CA is the regulatory body for accountancy in the country. So as a regulatory body, it must come in and issue us those sanctions so that that one will now become a deterrent for the rest of the auditors, for the rest of the audit firms, so that they will design and plan their audit in such a way that they will be able to what, carry out the work as it is supposed to be carried. Does it make sense? Yeah. So that is the idea about that. So these are some of the ways that we can uh, um, um, close the gap. Then another thing has to do with the audit firm itself. The audit firm must ensure that it is engaging the, an audit team that has expertise into the specific organization. Meaning that don't audit a firm or an organization that you don't have expertise in. So let you see, every audit firm has some level of expertise, a, apart from the top four, the top four audit firm, uh, the KPMGs, the Price Waterhouse, Deloitte and Touche, and NX and Young. Now, apart from them, many of the small audit firms they have focus. So one of, it can be telecommunication. It can be banking, it can be manufacturing, it can be insurance, it can be education. Indeed, if you have specialized in uh, education, then a telecommunication firm, firm approaches you to audit. Now when you say you don't have the expertise, you don't have to what? Accept the audit. Because when you go and accept the audit, you are rather ex expanding the gap because you will not be able to design your audit in such a way to be able to meet the objective of the audit. Right. So that is what we have to understand when it comes to why we undertake the audit. So number one, we say audit is the independent examination of financial statements. Why do we audit? The objective of audit is to express an opinion on the true and fair view or to express an opinion whether financial statement prepared represents a true and fair view of the entity. Then I mentioned that. That's why thing has to be the objective of the audit. And we said there are primary objectives, secondary objectives. Then I said, because of those primary and secondary objectives, people have different views of how auditor's role should be and what the auditor's role actually is. The difference between these two views, what people think the auditor's role should be and what the auditor's role actually is, is what we refer to as what? The expectation gap. Then we said that some of the ways through which the gap can be closed is the auditor designing the audit in such a way that he will be able to detect fraud and errors if they exist. Then you mentioned about education of the uh, role. So educating the public on the role of uh, auditors. Then the Institute of Chartered Accountant redefining the role of the role of auditors, issuing sanctions to various auditors and audit firms that are involved in unprofessional behavior, then the audit firm itself having the required resources to undertake a specific audits before undertaking it or before accepting the audit. So that is the issue about objective of auditors. We good? Yeah, okay. So the next thing is 
When do we audit? Now, if it is the audit of financial statements, then certainly we will carry out the audit after management has prepared and present what? The financial statements. So we start or we audit when management has prepared and present financial statements. Which emphasizes the fact that it is which emphasizes the fact that when it comes to the financial statements, one, management is responsible for its preparation and its what? Presentation. But the auditor is responsible to what? Independently examine the audit report, examine the financial statement, and express an opinion on it. Simple. So, financial statement preparation and presentation is the role, the responsibility of management, whilst the auditor's responsibility or role is the examination of the financial statements. This means the auditor cannot assist or participate in the auditing of the financial statement. And we'll look at this in a, in a brief moment under the book. In the preparation and presentation of the financial statement. So you cannot do that. So that is the way we audit after management has prepared and present financial statement. Then to the big bracket. Who undertakes the audit? So who performs an audit? Mm -hmm. Who performs an audit? Any idea? A practitioner, yeah? We can use the word practitioner. So we say that an audit is undertaken by an independent expert external auditor. Are you getting it? An independent expert external auditor. It's the same as what we call the practitioner. So an independent expert external auditor. Okay. So if the who is an independent expert external auditor, then the question we ask ourselves is, who qualified to be an auditor? Mm -hmm. Qualification of auditors. Who qualifies to be an auditor? What do you think? Who qualifies to be an auditor? Someone who has, who is knowledgeable about the uh, preparation of the financial Okay, knowledgeable. That's a key point. But we will turn it and put it this way: that the auditor or, or the individual must have written and pass a professional examination by a recognized qualification body. So he must written and pass a professional qualification examination by a sub-regulatory recognized qualification body. Recognized qualification body. So you must write, pass a professional examination by a recognized qualification body. An example of this is the ICAG. So the Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana, ACCA is also. Uh, a recognized qualification body. So you should write their exams and you should pass that exam. Next. Any other thing we can say? Mm -hmm. Now, not only should you pass their exams, 
you should also be a member of what those guys as well so must be a member mm -hmm. and stay a member of a recognized supervisory body the difference is that this one is just write and pass the exams but when you write and pass the exam you must be called into membership because when you are called into membership you have the expertise that is where you'll be given the license to practice as an auditor so and you must stay a member because there are times where you will be adopted as a member or called into membership but you will do something and so you will lose your membership it means when you lose your membership, you cannot undertake what? Any audit work. Do you see the difference? So this is what this one is about just writing the exams and pass, like what you are doing. But who we are, and not just are we a member of IC. Now you're a student member. But you have to become a professional member of the institution. That is the second aspect. It is only then that you can undertake what? An audit. After passing the exam, you it's not about automatically. Yeah, you become a member, but then you go through uh, experiences. There are a number of years you have to be work. You get the experience before we give you the license to practice as an auditor. So it's not automatic. Are you getting it? So you attend your graduation. Yay, I've graduated. I'm now C. Are you getting it? C. But then you will need some working experience. It could be three years, it could be five years from a recognized auditing firm in this country to support you with a letter, then now you will be invited and you'll be given license to practice as an auditor. Are you getting the idea? So that is how it is. So you must write the exams and pass. You must be a member and stay as a member. Then the third thing is that the auditor must not be the director, must not be a director or employee of the client entity. So you cannot be a director because remember the word I mentioned under the definition. What is auditing? It is the independent. If you are a director or you are an employee, then you are not going to be what? Independent. So you have to, be not, you must not be a director or an independent. Uh, uh, employee of the company also must not be a shareholder or a related party shareholder or related party of the client you must not be a shareholder meaning you shouldn't have any investment in the company you shouldn't have any financial interest in the company you, you shouldn't also be a related party. Now, a related party organization is an organization that renders services to companies which are partly joint. So, for instance, if you have a company, and I have a, a company, and let's say you have a security company, and then I employ your security company because I know you, and I am on your board of your security company as maybe the board chairman, of your security company. Then I said, okay, we will employ your security, you will employ your company to provide security for my company. Meaning that from that hence for, from that time we become what? Related parties because I am on the board here and I'm the CEO or the director there. So we become related parties. Meaning that I cannot audit that firm. You cannot audit this firm because we are what? Related parties. Then the auditor must not have any close or family relationship with key staff or with management. With management. So you cannot audit the company of your father of your mother, of your sister, you can't audit their affairs. So you say, oh, daddy, 
I'm a fan of it. Kony, Oka Pesh, 50,000 eh, but I have it 20 eh. <laughs> so that you don't give it out. No, you cannot audit. Why? Because in that case, you will not be what? Independent as an auditor. So the list is endless. We can talk about a lot of things, but these are some of the five things that we can talk about as to the qualification of who can undertake the audit. Any question? No. All right. Now, the next question we ask ourselves is, okay, now we've spoken about the appointment of auditors. I've mentioned that auditors can be appointed by the shareholders to audit the financial statements. Also, management can appoint their auditors if it is the first time the company is what? Going to undertake an audit. However, every audit assignment lasts for a year. And reappointment may have to be done by a pass of resolution at the annual general meeting. So management can also employ auditors. Then we said regulatory bodies such as the Bank of Ghana, uh, the Insurance Commission, the uh, general, the Commissioner General for the, uh, of the Ghana Revenue Authority, they can also employ what? Uh, auditors in that case. Then there are other stakeholders that can also employ what? Uh, shareholders and uh, auditors to undertake the audit work. So that is the issue about the appointment. But then we will come back to the stages of how all of those things occur. Okay. But the question we ask is, okay, if you are appointed, you have to undertake all the background work. We will come back to all that. But what are the rights of the auditor? What are the rights of the auditor? If you are now appointed as the auditor, resolution has been passed, you've been awarded a contract, what are your rights as an auditor? Any idea? Um, to receive the necessary... The necessary... <laughs> eh, it's there, bring it. <laughs> the necessary what? Okay, things for a smooth audit. So what do you think are some of the things you will need to work with? Um, the financial information, mm -hmm. historical financial information, and audit um, office space. Okay, at their client's premises? Yes. Okay, so what, what, one of the things you're trying to say is that the auditor has the right to have explanation on all transactions in an inquiry. So, if you go to the company and you say, ah, why is it that this invoice was not signed? Why is it that that invoice was not signed? Why is it that the asset was not approved by the board but it was still bought? Then the manager said, who the hell are you to say that? Are you getting the idea? Meaning you are not going to be having what? Explanation for that transaction. But the auditor has a right to have that. Another right of the auditor is to have access to all, like you were saying, have access to all financial, let me put it this way, all documents necessary for the audit. There are times you will need title deed documents. There are times you will need 